It's an opportunity for you to retreat from your lives for just a few days and to remove the constant stimulation in your external environment that reminds you of who you think you are as a personality. To separate yourself from the people you know and the places you go and the things that you do at the exact same time every single day. Long enough for you to be reminded of what you already know. And I want you to know that every time you learn something new, you make new connections in your brain. That's what learning is. Learning is forging new synaptic connections. And the Nobel Prize laureate, Kandel, in the year 2000, found that when people learn just one bit of information, they doubled the number of connections in their brain from 1,300 connections to 2,600 connections. But if they didn't review that information, if they didn't repeat it, if they didn't think about it, those circuits pruned apart within hours or days. All of this information that you were learning this weekend, if knowledge is power, then knowledge about yourself is self-empowerment. But all of this philosophical, theoretical, spiritual, intellectual knowledge and information is for you to do something with when you return back into your lives. And if you can take that information and apply it, personalize it, demonstrate it in some way, initiate that knowledge into action, if you get your behaviors to match your intentions, if you get your actions equal to your thoughts, if you get your mind and body working together, you are going to have a new experience. Now, when you're in the midst of an experience, all of your five senses plug you into the external environment. And as you're gathering all of this vital sensory data, all that information rushes back to your brain through five different sensory pathways. And it causes jungles of neurons to organize themselves into networks and patterns. The moment those neurons string into place, the brain makes a chemical, and that chemical is called a feeling or an emotion. And the moment you feel like a leader, the moment you feel like a patient parent, the moment you feel compassion, now you are teaching your body chemically to understand what your mind has intellectually understood. And in that moment, you are beginning to embody the truth of that philosophy. And if knowledge is for the mind, experience is for the body, you are embodying that information and signaling new genes and new ways, and you are rewriting your own biological program. But if you've done it once, it must mean you should be able to do it again. And if you can repeat an experience over and over again, over and over again, at will, on command, you are going to neurochemically condition your mind and body to work as one. And when the mind and body merge as one, or the body now knows how to do it as well as the mind, now it's innate in you. It's automatic. It's second nature. It's easy. You've practiced it so many times that you don't even know how you do it. It's a automatic subconscious program. So our job on this journey is to go from philosopher to initiate to master, from knowledge to experience to wisdom, from mind to body to soul, from thinking to doing to being, to learning it in your head, practicing it with your hands, and knowing it by heart. And you and I have all the biological and neurological machinery to do this. And this is a time in history where it's not enough to know. This is a time in history to know how. And science has become the contemporary language of mysticism. In fact, science demystifies the mystical. And if you can combine a little quantum physics with a little neuroscience, with a little neuroendocrinology, with a little psychoneuroimmunology, a little epigenetics, 
you know, they all point the finger at possibility. And people are beginning to not wait for crisis or trauma or disease or diagnosis or loss to get about the business of change in their life. Because you can learn and change in a state of pain and suffering, which has been the old model of reality up until this point, or you can learn and change in a state of joy and inspiration. Which would you like to do at this point? <laughs> so then, I'm curious, how many people in this audience believe in the idea that the way you think has some effect on your body or your life? I'm just curious. <laughs> you do, yes? Well, how many people actually woke up this morning and consciously created a future? Uh, You know why you don't do it? Because you don't believe it's true. If you knew that your thoughts created your reality, would you ever miss a day in creating the life that you want? And would you ever let any thought slip by your awareness that you didn't want to experience? Now, you told me that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, yes? yes. Poke the person next to you, please. So you think, this is science now, 60 to 70,000 thoughts in one day. 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts as the day before. <laughs> Hint, because the same thoughts will always lead to the same choices. And the same choices will lead to the same behaviors. And the same behaviors will create the same experiences. And the same experiences produce the same emotions. And those same emotions drive your very same thoughts. And your biology, your neurocircuitry, your neurochemistry, your hormones, and even your genetic expression are equal to how you think, how you act, and how you feel. And how you think, how you act, and how you feel is called your personality. And your personality creates your personal reality. That's it. So then if you wanted to create a new personal reality, a new life, you would have to change your personality, wouldn't you? Hello? Yes. Yes. Poke the person next to you again. Which means then you'd have to start thinking about what you've been thinking about and change it. You'd have to become aware of your unconscious habits and behaviors and modify them. And then you'd have to look at those emotions that keep you anchored to the past and decide, do these emotions belong in my future? You see, most people try to create a new personal reality as the same personality, and it doesn't work. You're literally going to have to become someone else. And so, you can't run up to me and say, how come I'm not living in Santa Fe, New Mexico with my three dogs? Because <laughs> I'll tell you, the personality who's living in Santa Fe, New Mexico looks nothing like that. So there's a principle in neuroscience that says that nerve cells that fire together. So if you keep thinking the same thoughts, making the same choices, demonstrating the same behaviors, creating the same experiences that stamp the same networks of neurons into the exact same patterns, all for the familiar feeling you call you, and you keep doing that over and over again, you are going to begin to hardwire your brain into a very finite signature. The most commonly fired, neurologically wired set of thoughts, behaviors, and emotions that's acquired through frequent repetition. You've done it so many times that you begin to think within the box of your brain. So then, would you agree with me then? 
that new thoughts should lead to new choices, and new choices should lead to new behaviors. Come on. And new behaviors should create new experiences. And new experiences should create new feelings and new emotions. And those new feelings and new emotions should inspire new thoughts, and that's called evolution. Yes? So then, you told me that you said that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny. So if you wake up in the morning, now reason this with me, feelings and emotions are the end product of past experiences. And you can remember experiences better because you can remember how they feel. So if you wake up in the morning and then you come back to your senses, and then you glance over at the person laying next to you and you say, who is that? <laughs> then you say, wait, 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 wait. Let me just remember all my problems. Oh, whoa, now I feel like myself. <laughs> Almost lost my mind there. Would you agree then? The moment you feel the familiar feeling called you, and those emotions drive your thoughts, you are thinking in the past. Because if you can't think greater than how you feel, or feelings have become the means of thinking, then you are thinking in the past. And your body, as the unconscious mind, does not know the difference in your life between an actual experience that creates an emotion and an emotion that you create by thought alone. To the body, it's exactly the same. So people then, the moment they feel that familiar emotion and that emotion starts to activate circuits in their brain equal to that emotional state, they are now thinking and feeling in the past. And how you think and how you feel creates a state of being. Because thoughts are the vocabulary of the mind, and feelings are the vocabulary of the body. And how you think and how you feel creates your state of being. And the redundancy of thinking the same thoughts that turn on the same circuits in your brain to produce the same level of mind begins to signal another part of your brain to make a chemical for you to begin to feel exactly the way you were just thinking. And the moment you feel that feeling, the brain is monitoring the body, and it begins to generate more thoughts equal to that feeling, which creates more chemicals for you to feel the same way, and then think the same way, and feel the same way, and think the same way. And the redundancy of that cycle conditions the body to subconsciously become the mind of that emotion. And the moment that occurs, the body literally is in the past. And it's believing it's in the same past experience, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and 365 days a year. The body literally is in the past. And you can't create a new future holding on to the emotions of the past. So then, would you agree with me? The moment you become conscious of your unconscious thoughts, the moment you become aware of your automatic habits and behaviors, the moment you observe those emotions that bring you to a lower denominator every day in your life, the moment you're becoming conscious of what you've been unconscious to, because 95% of who you are by the time you're 35 years old is a set of memorized behaviors, emotional reactions, beliefs, perceptions, and attitudes that function like a subconscious computer program. That the moment you become conscious of what you've been unconscious to, now you're ready to change. Come on. Yes. And if you can observe those states of mind and body, it means you are no longer the program. You are the consciousness observing the program and you begin to objectify your subjective self because for the first time you are looking at yourself through the eyes of someone else. And because of the size of the frontal lobe, 40% of your entire brain, 
the crowning achievement of the human being, the latest piece of neurological machinery, the fact that you can pay attention to those states of mind and body means you could modify who you are to do a better job in life, and that's called neuroplasticity. And so then, here's the old self, and here's the new self, and you got to cross a river. And the hardest part about change is not making the same choice as you did the day before. And if a habit is a redundant set of automatic, unconscious thoughts, behaviors, and emotions that's acquired through frequent repetition, a habit is when you've done something so many times that your body now knows how to do it better than your brain. Would you agree then that the moment you decide to no longer complain, make excuses, feel sorry for yourself, talk about your best friend, judge your co-worker, the moment you decide to do something differently and make a different choice, you just stepped into that river. And it's going to feel uncomfortable. Get ready is going to feel unfamiliar. There is going to be some uncertainty and there is going to be some unpredictability. And some people would rather hold on to their guilt than step into the unknown. Some people would rather be unworthy and suffering than take a chance in possibility. And the moment you decide to make a different choice, the body which has been conditioned emotionally to be the mind wants to return back to familiar territory. And it starts sending signals back to the brain and you just said, I'm no longer going to be a victim today. And the first two hours goes really well. <laughs> but the body, which has been conditioned to be the mind, the servant is now the master. It starts sending signals back to the brain. And you know what it says. Why don't you start tomorrow? <laughs> Tomorrow's a better day. I really can't do this. It's too hard. It's my ex-husband's fault. It's my father's fault. This doesn't feel right. And that's the body sending signals back to the brain, causing you to think in the past. And if you respond to that thought as if it's true, that thought will lead to the same choice, which will lead to the same behavior, which will create the same experience, which will produce the same emotion, and then you'll say, this feels right. No, it feels familiar. Crossing that river from the old self to the new self is the neurological, the biological, the chemical, the hormonal, genetic death of the old self. And people who step into that void, who step into that unknown, will say to me, Dr. Joe, I'm in the unknown. I can't predict my future. And I'll tell them the best way to predict your future is to create it. Not from the known, but from the unknown. And that place of unknown is the field of potentials called the quantum field. What thoughts do you want to fire and wire in your brain? What behaviors will you demonstrate in one day, one lifetime? And what if you were to rehearse those behaviors in your mind before you started your day? The latest research in neuroscience shows that you can change your brain just by thinking differently, which means now your brain is no longer a record of the past. It is now, in fact, a map to the future. Because as you rehearse and plan your behaviors and review them in your mind, you begin to install the neurological hardware in your brain to look like the event has already occurred. Now, great people like you, common people like you are doing the uncommon. And they are not waiting for their healing to feel wholeness. 
They are not waiting for their success to feel empowerment. They're not waiting for their new relationship to feel love or their new job to feel gratitude or their wealth to feel abundance or the mystical moment to feel awe. That's the old model of reality of cause and effect. Waiting for something outside of you to change how you feel inside of you, to give you relief. And the moment you feel better inside of you, you begin to pay attention to whoever or whatever caused it. And that event creates a memory, and that's Newtonian physics, the physics of predictability. But the quantum model of reality is about causing an effect, which means when you're in awe, you're going to have a mystical experience. When you feel empowered, you are going to create success. When you feel whole and satisfied with who you are, there will be a healing. When you feel so worthy and so abundant, you know your wealth is coming. And when you're in love with your life, in love with yourself, you will create an equal. And when you get up from your meditation or your internal practice in a state of gratitude, your body as the unconscious mind already accepts, believes, and surrenders to that outcome. And that job will come. And that's causing an effect in your life. And there isn't a person in this room that is so special to be excluded from that phenomenon. And the hardest part of all of this is making the time to do it. So then here's my question. Can you believe in a future that you can't see or experience with your senses yet but you've thought about enough times in your mind that your brain is literally changed to look like the experience has already occurred. Latest research in neuroscience says it's possible. And can you fall in love with a future potential that already exists in the quantum field? And how many potentials exist in the quantum field? A few. Hello. Poke the person next to you. Come on, poke them. Can you fall in love with a future potential that already exists in the quantum field, so much so that your body as the unconscious mind is believing it's living in that future reality in the present moment, and you're signaling new genes in new ways to change your body to look like the event has already occurred? The latest research in epigenetics says it's absolutely possible. Now think about this. You're geniuses, right? <laughs> if there's physical evidence in your brain and body to look like the event has already occurred, <laughs> relax, because the event is going to find you. And it's going to come in a way that you least expect. Why? Because if you can expect it, it's nothing new. It's got to rock your world. It's got to catch you off guard. And it has to leave no doubt that what you did inside of you produced some effect outside of you. And when you can correlate the changes you made inside of you with the effect you produced outside of you, you're going to pay attention to what you did. And you're going to do it again. And when that experience lands in your lap and surprises you. And by the way, the brain learns by mistakes and surprises. Which would you like a few of? <laughs> when that event catches you off guard and it lands in your lap and finds you, the joy and the excitement and the awe and the wonder and the freedom and the inspiration that's created, the energy of those emotions are going to inspire you to want to create again and again and again. And you will look back at your entire past and you won't want to change anything in your past because it brought you to that present moment. And that's the moment the past no longer exists. Are you with me? So then, most people 
You say to them, uh, why are you so angry? Why are you so afraid? Why are you so judgmental? Why are you so bitter? What do you think they normally say? I am this way because of this event that happened to me 35 years ago. <laughs> and from a biological standpoint, it means I haven't changed in 35 years. Are you with me? Yes. So then, Scientific American, a prestigious magazine, says that 50% of what you talk about in your past isn't even true. <laughs> they call it creative memory. And if your brain is organized to reflect everything you know in your life, your brain is a record of the past. It's an artifact of everything you've learned and experienced to this moment. Would you agree with me then? That the moment you search for the familiar feeling called you and those emotions are driving your thoughts, you are going to be predictable in your life because those thoughts will lead to the same behaviors and those behaviors will create the same experiences all to reaffirm the familiar feeling called you. And people get caught in these loops. They have experiences in their life that brand them emotionally. And there's a refractory period of chemicals that creates a change biologically in the body. And if you don't know how to control your emotional reactions, and you allow those emotions to linger for hours or days, you know what that's called? That's called a mood. <laughs> What's wrong with you? I'm in a mood. <laughs> really? Here it comes. What happened? Well, I had this experience nine days ago, and I'm having one long emotional reaction. <laughs> and you keep that same refractory period going on for weeks or months. That's called a temperament. What's up with him? I don't know. Let's ask him. Why is he so bitter? Why are you so bitter? Well, I had this thing happen to me seven months ago. I got fired from my job, and I'm memorizing my emotional reaction. <laughs> and you keep that same refractory period going on for years on end. That's called the personality. And people wear their emotions on their sleeve and they think that's who they are. So then in order for a person to truly change, the question is, are you going to be defined by the memories of the past biologically, or are you going to be defined by a vision of the future? Because if you're waking up every single morning, what does everybody do now when they wake up in the morning? What's the first thing they do? Come on. Jennifer's eating carbohydrates again. It's on Facebook. <laughs> oh my God, my high school boyfriend's looking for me. I remember him from 11th grade. He was kind of cute. <laughs> then you check your WhatsApp, you check your text, you check your Facebook, you tweet, you Twitter, you check your Instagram, your Pinterest, you know. Then you, you, know, you check the news and now you're ready to start the day. <laughs> because it's no longer that your personality is creating your personal reality.